Hello, my name is Hannah Maiko and I'm the Community Organizing Associate at River Network. I am thrilled to welcome you to the virtual River Rally experience. Hosted annually by River Network, River Rally provides an inspiring forum for nonprofit groups from across the US and beyond, as well as for agency and foundation representatives, industry innovators, philanthropists, academics, students, and community leaders. This year, we have the opportunity to bring all of you together virtually, and we are beyond excited to be able to open up this incredible content and make it available online. We wanna thank our foundations and businesses who have joined us as River Rally sponsors. Your support plays a vital role in our ability to provide and expand access to the practical knowledge and hope that are essential to, future, to a future where healthier rivers and clean water are paramount. This on-demand workshop is titled Volunteer Programs That Transform Organizations. This presentation does feature two downloadable worksheets that you will have access to. Um, you can find those in the documents tab right up above our video. Um, if you want to check that out and take a moment to download those, you can pause the recording and do that and then come back and resume when you're ready. Our presenters will point you in the direction of each one that you need to utilize and reference throughout the presentation. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce our presenters today. Um, with us today, we have Baird Strawn, who is the principal at Watergrass in Annapolis, Maryland. And we also have with us Jason Frenzel, who previously served as the president of the Association of Leaders and Volunteer Engagement, and who currently serves as the stewardship coordinator at the Huron River Watershed Council. So I'm gonna turn things over to them for the rest of the presentation. Thank you. Cool, thank you, Hannah. I am super um, excited to be here with you folks to talk about volunteer engagement. And I, as everybody who knows me knows, I'm the numbers guy, so I really enjoy getting into the numbers and showing and fight, figuring out what's been successful and then sharing it. In this session, we'd like to first uh, appreciate just how rare vo repeat volunteers are. This uh, session will be all about getting volunteers to come back more than once and how that builds your volunteer programs and can be central to the success of your organization. And then we'd like you to consider whether your organization really makes volunteers central to its work. And we'd like to try out a tool that helps you reconceptualize your work so that volunteers are that the work that they do really is central to the mission of the organization. And that tool, um, not to steal our fire too much, is a planning tool, a needs assessment of what your organization needs. And Jason brings with him a lot of experience that can help us turn these our volunteer programs from things that sort of uh, grew spontaneously to things that not only grew spontaneously, but are also uh, consciously plan to give us the best results. So um, the Watergrass database, we have about 40 organizations that use it. And they've used it for an average of seven years or so. So we've got a lot of data on volunteerism because people track their volunteers in the database. And so here is, um, I'd like to compare three organizations. Here's one organization based in a large metropolitan area. And they, they have a dynamite volunteer program. Um, they do outings, which are fairly elaborate, and take about five hours each, which is part of the reason that people don't come back that often for them. Nevertheless, they are striving to get more than 8% of their volunteers to return a second time. And they're trying to develop a program that will give them ongoing volunteer leaders to help them do these events. Um, so that's one, uh, it's one example for you, and, uh, and it's not uncommon. As we looked through the volunteer numbers and asked, how many times do people come back? 8%, 10% is about average. Organization 2 also has an incredibly successful volunteer program, also uh, in a in a, an urban area, they do smaller um, events or shorter events, so it's easier for people to come back. Um, they've been around, uh, the first organization's been doing this for about six years. This organization's been doing these events for more like 
10 years now, um, the longer you do an organization, the more likely people are to be repeat volunteers because they're, you give them, them more opportunities to come back. And then the third organization, which is the Huron River Watershed Council, which is uh, located near Ann Arbor, Michigan, not far from Detroit. And they have, um, they really hit it out of the park. We don't really have any other organizations with comparable numbers. So they've got in their almost um, 20 plus years of data. They've got 4,200 people who've who volunteered once and more than half of them have come back at least one more time. And 38% of them came back, have been at three or more events. And what's kind of incredible is they've got 429 people, about 10% who's been, who've been back at least 10, 12 times. And those people who've been back at least 12 times are volunteer leaders who actually help them keep their organ, to keep these programs going and strengthen their outreach into the community. Um, and Jason, uh, what's this meant for you guys? Um, yeah, <laughs> there's a lot there. Um, I guess the thing that I wanted to bring up at this point is, you know, there are a lot of organizations that manage volunteers and work with volunteers. Um, and one of my goals in giving presentations is always to offer a series of best practices um, so that we can make our volunteer programs um, better, so that we improve our return rate, so we can return, uh, improve our program delivery. You know, the, the goal here, I like, to, I like to say that pretty much everybody is built to work with other humans. It's sort of like how we're programmed, right? Um, but even in soft skill um, work, there are best practices that we should consider in trying to implement. And so we'll, we'll go through a series of things, both organizationally and volunteer management um, directly, uh, that you can consider to improve your program delivery uh, while, while still getting your bottom line and your, your mission uh, accomplished. As to Baird's question, um, you know, we've, these numbers are, are skewed a little bit because we've been a lot around a little bit longer than the two previous examples. Um, this is 25 years worth of volunteers um, as opposed to 10. Um, but the program structure of inviting people back, um, making it very easy to come and go, making it very easy for people to join with their families or their friends or their groups, um, and uh, intentionally inserting a series of methods to to, to psychologically get people interested in continuing to come back is really important. Um, and that's how you drive uh, increased uh, uh, repeat volunteerism, which we'll go over a little bit why that's important also, but we can all, we can all agree and understand that um, while we want some turnover and churn in our volunteers so that we get more new people um, and more people understanding our um, mission, we also want some people to come back because it makes a lot of efficiency um, and it makes our, our management um, easier and easier as time goes on. So here's a question for you. What do you, when your program managers look at this graph, what benefits do they see? Oh, that's an interesting question. Um, I think, uh, you know, the primary one is the, the way that we deliver programs can increasingly be put on middle management volunteers. So we can, we can put more weight on the volunteers as leaders themselves. Um, and that makes our program, program delivering program management easier and easier as time goes on. Um, I'll talk about a couple programs later where um, I'm a program administrator, but the actual project is run exclusively by volunteers. I'm there to support the volunteers in their service delivery. So that, that allows me and a number of my uh, coworkers to deliver more programming um, and get more on the ground work and hours in for the organization and the mission. Cool. Um, one of the things that I know about Huron is that you guys are actually certified by the state. So the state recognizes your water quality monitoring data and acts upon it. And that data is actually generated in the vast majority of it by volunteers. Yep. Um, Which is and, uncommon in Michigan. 
and it's and and it's uncommon across the United States, and that speaks to the level of the level of the quality of the monitoring that you're doing and how you're able to maintain that level, even though you're using volunteers. Yep. We're also hired by the state to train other volunteer organizations throughout the state. Cool. All right, I'll move on. So, um, so you've looked at two examples or three examples here of the number of volunteers who signed up for one event and then the number who came back for more. So what, what I'd like you to do now is just take a second, go to worksheet one and estimate how many first time volunteers or how many volunteers total do you think you get in a year or over the period of two and a half years in recent, in recent history. And then how many of them do you think came back more than once? And more than that. And if you don't have any notion, then I've added some questions at the bottom. And if you want more time, you can pause the presentation, but I'll continue on. So what's the one of the values of repeat volunteers is obviously, um, well, there are various values. One, you don't have to reach out as much for new volunteers because you're not losing as many old ones. You've got less volunteer attrition, so you've got more experience, which with something like the water quality monitoring program is really essential, and you get better results. So then there's the fundraising aspect and one of the sad realities of volunteer work with organizations is that we bring in or with river organizations is that we bring in a ton of volunteers but very few of them actually convert over to donors that is that they give so that if you take a look at this slide you can see that of those people over those 25 years 87 percent of the people who showed up to volunteer never gave and a small that leaves 13% or so, 5% who gave $100 or less in their lifetime. And Baird, just to be clear, is this the Huron or all the organizations you work with? This is here, uh, thank you. This is Huron, just Huron. Which we're happy to share. Okay. And 4% gave from 100 to 500 over their lifetime, which isn't insignificant, $41,000 it turns out to. But it also turns out that among those people who volunteered, who first came to the organization as volunteers, there are folks who turned into really significant donors. And so um, this small slice here gives over their lifetime over a million dollars to Huron. And I was surprised to look back at the other two organizations, run these numbers, and the same was true. The majority of people never gave, the vast majority never gave, but there was a small group of people who became, who were started as volunteers and who got hooked on it and who became very generous donors to the organization. All right. So repeat volunteers are worth a lot in terms of dollars and program impact. And that, um, the program impact, the dollars, and I'd say the continuity of the organization. And finally, the roots that you have in the community because you know you've got 100 people out there in the community who you could call on to go to a community meeting or to speak to an elected representative. That gives you roots in the community that gives you more influence. So those are the values of re retaining existing volunteers and cultivating them. And let me turn this over to Jason. Great, thank you, Baird. Um, for those of you who know me, the virtual uh, sphere is not my native location, um, both by age but also by presence. I like to <laughs> I like to move around the room a lot and wave my hands, and it's challenging just to stand still and talk to you, <laughs> and talk to you all, and not see the uh, interest in your eyes as uh, as I talk. So I will uh, I will try to entertain myself while entertaining you all. Um, so uh, I'm going to go through two different segments of volunteer management and program delivery. The first portion here is going to be sort of rudimentary and regular um, uh, retention strategies. Um, and then the second component is how do we integrate volunteer programming into other programming 
Um, how do we make it more of a, a systematic process and procedure within the organization um, and to get more organizational buy-in um, and to meet those mission critical goals as I was talking about earlier. So the first thing I want you to think about is um, when you've gone and volunteered uh, at a place, why have you gone back or, or why have you not gone back? And I think it's it's really easy to think of the reasons why we don't go back. You know, the organization wasn't ready for us. It didn't feel like my time was worthwhile. Um, I didn't feel valued. Um, and the experience that we have that lends us to understanding that, it, there are a lot of really specific things that happen in that space um, that give us the sense that we weren't valued. So how do we turn that experience on its head and say, how do we fix every single small nuance that might interest a person or a specific person is going to glom onto that's their reason for coming back. Um, of course, you have, to, you have to iterate on program delivery many, many times to be able to fix all of those little problems for every different perspective. And you're never gonna be finished with it, but that's the goal is to, to aim for this, what do they say, aim for the stars and you'll hit the moon. Um, so while you're thinking about your own experiences, I'd love you to think about why your volunteers come back and why your volunteers um, sometimes don't come back. Um, and of course, a lot of the time, it's because of their own priorities. Why is it that they need to go to the babysitter, to the grocery store, to soccer practice, um, to more meetings? Um, but when we prioritize something, we also, uh, when we use the language of prioritization, we also start to understand that our organization and our offerings are one of a suite of priorities for our volunteers. And we can start to think about how we can manage our programming and our interaction with our volunteers so as to become a higher priority for them more regularly. Not all, it's not gonna ever be that we're gonna be the top priority for them or ever gonna be the top priority on a regular basis. But is it once a year? Is it three times a year? Is it once every three years that they come back to us and we are a high enough priority? Um, so hopefully we'll give you some ideas um, on how to do that. So I'm going to talk about three components of retention. One is volunteer motivations, the um, continual engagement, and the ladder of engagement, which is a process that I developed a number of years ago. Um, so thinking about motivations, there are a lot of different theories on human motivations. You think about why we go to work, why we uh, make breakfast, why we get out of bed sometimes when we're locked in our homes for multiple months. Um, there are a lot of motivations to a lot of things. Um, and so I've synthesized a number of motivational analysis and um, procedures into a sort of like sense of, it's like a five point um, components of, of motivations. You know, I, people routinely come to me and say, I can't, I can't get a volunteer to do that. I couldn't ask a volunteer to do that. You know, that's, that's beyond, that's too low. That's beyond their ability. Um, and I think that takes the power away from the volunteer to say what they can and can't do, what they are and are not interested in. We have to assume that they're interested in our mission and we're all working on our mission together. Their motivation is internal that we interact with externally. So I've got volunteers here that are cleaning plates um, repeatedly for many hours, and some of them do return to the same job um, year after year at one of our big fancy fundraisers. They're back of house workers, that's the, you know, they're introverts, they prefer to be supportive and not have to be in the limelight. Great, awesome, this is a perfect spot for them as long as we make the work interesting and they understand that it um, directly ties to the mission and the goals of the organization. <clears throat> so back to motivations. Um, they're, depending on the organization that we work with or the volunteers are working with, making a substantive change out there in the world um, is often the largest motivation. And in my experience, doing natural lands and water management work um, that is by far the biggest one. They're, the, our volunteers are 
mostly interested in making the water quality better, making people's use and ability to be out in the environment um, safer. Um, and that's, that's their primary goal. And so we need to make sure our programming ties back to water quality at all, um, at all times. One, it needs to literally tie back so they can see it. But two, they need to be, the messaging that we send to them needs to reinforce that what they have done or what they are about to do directly ties to mission critical work. So whenever I do volunteer programming, I always have a one to four sentence in you know, a portion of the orientation that says, this is what we're doing today. This is the bigger picture of what this program is. And that program plays into our mission through these methodologies. I'll always give a couple quick stories. Um, you know, uh, people hate, there's, there's always a small portion of people that hate that we, uh, we, keep, we kill and keep all of our benthic macroinvertebrate samples um, in our scientific study. And of course, there's always a kid in the crowd that kind of gets a little shaky about that. Um, but we explain to them that the amount that we're collecting that day is less than a fish would eat. And some of the data that we've had in the past have gone on to create local and state legislation that has protected waterways throughout Michigan uh, for 20 years now. Um, and that sort of story with a little bit more anecdote goes a long way um, to reassuring them that the project that they're working on is mission critical. Um, and so whenever we can tie that in is really important. The other motivations that I think are very often useful um, is we have a lot of folks who come out for social reasons or the social bonds that they create in our volunteering um, reinforces their interest and locks them into associating themselves with the organization. Um, so creating social interactions that are uh, highly likely going to be positive is really important. Um, and then um, and then playing on those. So I know my volunteers who like to work together or prefer not to work with kids or something, and I make sure that that's how their experience rolls. Um, of course, uh, in different portions of our lives at different times or, or different ability levels, um, we wanna learn, and sometimes we wanna take that knowledge that we have and pass it on to others. Um, and then lastly, uh, another motivation is power. Um, you know, we don't really think about that so much in our watershed organizations, but oftentimes that's the reason. Um, it's not so much to have power to like wield power, but I like to think of it as some people are happy to have and wield power on our behalf. And so uh, working on legislation, being on our board of directors, things of that nature, some people are, are okay holding power. Um, and that's an okay thing for us to interact with them about. <clears throat> Moving on to the latter, uh, continual engage, oops, I forgot. There are a couple other motivations. One is, uh, if you're talking about the internet like we're on today, kittens are a great way to keep people motivated apparently. Um, but realistically, uh, keeping people fed is really important when they come to events that are longer than an hour or two. Um, continual engagement, so it's really important for us to um, offer our volunteers the opportunity to continually come back. We don't know when they will have time, we don't know when other priorities are going to get in the way of them working with us, um, but having continual engagement, be it just electronic reminders or newsletters that we're out there reminding them of the programs that they have been to and reminding of them of the programs that they could get involved in is really important. Um, this, the, you see the picture uh, on the screen, the lady in the back, um, I didn't meet her for like four or five years while I was on staff. She'd done a bunch of river cleanups here with one of our outfitter stores, a fly fishing shop. Um, and now she's coming and, run, and helping us run kids programming at a bunch of stuff because she, in the interim, had a kid who's now a few years old um, and she's just you know, that's what, that's where her life is. She disappeared for a couple of years because her kid was really little, but we were there and we reminded her repeatedly that we had things for her to do. Her interests have changed, her motivations have changed, and we have programming to support her current interests. Um, we also want to make sure, of course, when continually to demonstrate the impact, to reaffirm that the work that they're doing, um, have done and might do with us, um, has impact on our mission. Um, like I said just a moment ago, having a multitude of different programs is really important. When I first started at the Huron, we had um, three programs that were very intensive, uh, 
three quarter a day long, multiple times over the summer, really good citizen science projects, super, super good, like Baird was talking about um, on our behalf. We didn't have what I call gateway projects where people could just drop in for a couple hours and then go home, try us out for a minute and just let more people in the door. Um, and so we have doubled and tripled down on our river cleanups. We've doubled and tripled down on our um, availability to offer um, storm drain stenciling like programs. We actually glue those little placards on now um, and make that just really readily accessible for people to get more involvement in our mission. Um, and then cross pollination is the ability for, you know, when a person comes into the organization in one aspect or another, how often do they see and understand that there are a multitude of um, places for them in the organization? If they, if they come in and go to a benthic program and realize it's not really for them, do they see before they dismiss us that there's another option that they can do to get involved and stay involved with us that might be more intensive, might be less intensive, might be less with the creepy crawly bugs and more with uh, data or more field work or something. Um, so, when we have, when we have, when we showcase that they have the ability to do that um, before they leave and dismiss us, we up our retention rate also. Um, and then the personal connection, you know, you want, you want, when your volunteers come back more than once or twice, depending on the size of your programming, um, they should understand who you are, know a little bit about who you are. You should also, if possible, um, and the personal connections between volunteers, um, fostering those relationships. I've got two different pairs of volunteers. I've been doing working at the Huron for nine years now. Two different pairs of volunteers that have gotten married, um, and they they were one pair met th through our programming, and the other it was like early dates that they came out with us, um, and they had just had such a good time. Now we didn't we didn't make the marriage happen, um, but they have a very personal connection to us and through themselves to us. Uh, and then the last uh, motivation I want to talk about is our, um, what I call the ladder of engagement. This basically, the theory is let people in on really easy programming that's really quick, um, feels really accessible to a lot of different types of people, and then offer them and encourage them to take on more leadership or more responsibility internal to those programs and then internal to the organization. So we... A lot of us have uh, water quality benthic macro um, studies where we have small groups, teams. This is a, a, a family with a university group that came out a couple years ago. Um, so they come out and they volunteer one time. Now, if they had a really good time, are they going to come back? Probably. Um, but what else, what else can we build into our programming that ensures that they might come back? So we have within our benthic macroinvertebrate study, we have a, a leadership component. So two of these people are trained leaders have been out with us a number of times, which allows us to send out novice volunteers with them on our behalf. But those, uh, what, I, what I realized a, few, a number of years ago is those lead volunteers are our bottleneck in delivering more programming. So on our program evaluation at the end, that each one of these people have to fill out based on the structure of the interaction, the first question is, was there anybody on your team that you think would be a good leader? And so they get to, they get to rat on each, <laughs> on each other and say, yeah, so-and-so would be a great leader. And then come the next training, I say, hey, so-and-so, Bob said you'd be a great leader. Um, don't you wanna come out and do that thing again that you enjoyed? Um, and so we create budding leaders with, within the program that they already identify with. Uh, and then, and so you, you can see a number of those internal motivations playing into this. Then we take uh, another aspect, we'll take some of those volunteers who have been with us a number of times and we will offer to them to come and help out with our school education programming. <clears throat> this is data light sort of stuff, but it is very valuable to getting those kids hands on place based education. And I'm not going to bring out just anybody from the public to work with area youth. So associated with background checks and risk and liability, we also know these volunteers that are going out. And then, of course, eventually, uh, some of these volunteers rise to leadership within their own programming and become these superstars that um, run programs with and for us on our behalf. 
this lady, <laughs> this lady became, did one of those polar plunges as a fundraiser for us, which was, was pretty awesome. Um, yeah, that's, uh, that's what I had for that. Baird, do you wanna, do you wanna take over for a second? I would love to. Let's see if I can get my, aha, uh -huh, bring my video back too. Um, and uh, this is just, because I'm the numbers guy, I said, well, is that really true? So we did a little analysis of their numbers to see of the people who volunteer for macroinvertebrate and monitoring events, how many of them had attended the training for the leaders of those events. And it turned out that about 17% had. So approximately one in five people on in those collecting activities would be a person who'd had training and actually been certified by Jason and his organization. Um, and that, uh, it does two things. One, it produces good quality data, and it, uh, but it also elevates the professionalism of the encounter so that the people who come to it have an experience where they say, wow, that's, um, that felt professional and it felt like there was something there that I could really learn. And that's, once again, a great draw. I think it's important. Uh, so we, like I said, the leaders are the bottleneck in this program for us to do more implementation. So we, we double down and st say that pretty directly. Um, and then we use that tattling on your friends sort of scenario. Um, the other thing that this showcases is 17, directly 17% 17 of, of our volunteers from this programming are coming back um, because they're coming to the training. So they have to come to the event once to understand the event, and then they come to the training. Um, and so we are directly getting them more invested in the mission through their time um, by talking them into just showing up on, a, again, a, a very low level interaction where they can um, easily say yes or no. And I'd, I'd weigh in there and I'd say you've got 17% who are willing to step up to take the leader collector training and then they're gonna go back to the monitoring events. So they're not just coming back once, they're coming back multiple times. And you've probably got a lot of people who say, well, that was a good experience. I don't have time to go to the leader collector mon uh, training, but I'm going back for yep. the, so your, your retention rate in this is probably, my guess would be 40 or 50%, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And we have, it's, it's, it's very low single digits, the people who attend the training and then don't come back again is very low. <clears throat> Moving on. Do, do, do. So I just wanted to talk, uh, so this portion I wanted to talk about how we integrate volunteer program development into our organization. Um, and so this is, a, this is sort of just program development postulate or system um, that's moderately familiar to most of us in one way or another related and interpreted through a volunteer management perspective. Um, so uh, one, of the, one of the things that I re run into a lot is that when people develop new volunteer programming, they don't, they don't tie it to the goals of the organization or the, um, or the program, which really starts to get develop problems um, when, you're, when you're thinking about that whole thing that I mentioned about how volunteers need to see the work that they're doing tied back to the mission um, and that their work is mission critical. If you, if you can't explicitly show your, your mission or your programmatic goals and tie that to the work that they're doing, um, they're gonna see that at some point um, and that becomes very demotivational. Um, so from the goals, we go into a needs analysis, which I'm gonna talk about for the next few slides. Um, and from that brings on our volunteers. Um, and so I wanted to showcase that the, the way that we insert our volunteer program as, as, a, as a program of the organization is this needs analysis. Um, it's where we, where we insert, uh, as, as a volunteer manager, as a professional who manages uh, human resources, this is where I get to insert the greater community into our program uh, deployment. Um, and then the rest of the circle is simply how we go about that, um, which Baird and I are happy to give a presentation on at some future River Rally, but not today. Um, so as we move into <clears throat> the needs analysis, I would like you to grab the, um, 
the power the PDF attachment uh, called volunteer leader needs assessment worksheet. Um, it is produced by points of light, which is a national organization. Um, you might remember the thousand points of light um, by the original Bush for some of those who are old enough to remember that. Um, Points of Light is also the organization that, has, that started and runs AmeriCorps and Senior Corps. Um, so they're a, they're a great group um, also. So I would say, um, you know, we all, do, we all do some sort of river work, right? We're all out there collecting benthic macroinvertebrates like this, um, like this photo. Um, <clears throat> but where are, where are our bottlenecks in, um, of being able to deploy more resources to get more work done towards our mission? Um, and the needs analysis is, is my conceptualization of where we can do that. Um, how do we have the ability to um, increase our program delivery? Um, and uh, the example that I wanted to go through for myself uh, or for from our programming is our um, summer internship program. Um, and so I'll start with that. Uh, the lady on our left is one of our uh, early summer interns uh, a couple years ago. She approached us when she was in high school and said, hey, I'm kind of interested in this. Can I come out? I'm underage. And I was like, <laughs> and this, is, this happens pretty regularly. Um, if, uh, if a person is underage I, uh, and wants to come out on, on our field work, I say, I need to have a conversation with your parents and your parents need to sign your liability waiver. Um, I ended up talking the whole family into coming the first time. Um, and then since then, uh, she and her sister have come out repeatedly and the parents stay home because it's just, it's just not their thing. Um, but this young lady was um, interested in getting more and more involved. And she's been dragging her friends or peers from school in. Um, and then as I was talking about, we tie her to other leaders who know uh, and have experience. She's coming into our internship program now. Um, as with a lot of our interns, we are approached by a bunch of folks who are up for uh, K-12, like 11th or 12th grade, or, or more regularly people who are in undergrad uh, programs that want to get something on their resume. And eight years ago, <clears throat> when I was new, we had a few people like that approach us, and we really didn't have a project for it. Um, we didn't have a place to put them, um, and we've had so much success through analyzing what the interns can and can't accomplish for us um, that they now we now get somewhere between, depending on the year, three and four thousand hours from our interns um, per summer. Um, there's a, there's a lot to that, but I want to uh, just open up that uh, concept for you as we go through this needs analysis. So first, uh, identifying organizational goals. Um, so this is our leader collector training, one of two per year. So I told you that this is our bottleneck, having enough trained leaders and collectors. And we almost always have somewhere between 15 and 25 people at these two yearly trainings. And it's still our bottleneck, which shows that well, we're doing great. This is also a great time for us to recruit um, recruit interns from younger groups, uh, like the like the high school student on the far left here. Um, <clears throat> but the identifying uh, goals and needs for me is that opportunity for you as a program delivery officer or a volunteer manager or a pseudo volunteer manager to work with anybody and everybody in your organization to brainstorm around implementation. Um, Brainstorming is a super fun exercise for a lot of people because it gets their juices flowing. Everybody's right all the time, um, sort of rah rah, um, hugs and hugs and love all around the table sort of stuff. And it, so that can be a great way for us to bring in program officers who are a little bit more skeptical of our volunteer programming or implementation. If we can brainstorm outside of the box with them to get ideas generated that they're interested in. Um, that's a great way to bring people on um, because, you know, a lot of people have a lot of apprehension about um, allowing volunteers or just other professionals to do their work. Um, we, there's a lot of psychology behind that. Um, and I also like to insert in here existing challenges because some, some people will gravitate towards brainstorming around fixing challenges. <clears throat> um, I'd love for you at this point and for the next three slides to take a break um, and fill out that worksheet for us. Um, it follows along pretty closely to my PowerPoint, 
Um, and so you can fill out the first handful of questions here. <clears throat> uh, another way to identify your needs as an organization, oops, don't get into the cool slide, oof, um, is what capacity do you need to, to be able to implement um, your programming? And so what knowledge skills are needed, uh, what capacity um, can you try to bring on that are community resources? So we now have these interns, we have 30 interns a summer, um, and they all know how to do uh, field work. They all know how to do um, some data analysis. And so we'll stick a few of them on all sorts of different projects that this summer, um, well, assuming we have a summer uh, field season, uh, they're supposed to work on 15 different program implementation across multiple, uh, all of our programming internally and a couple different external organizations. Um, so how can we identify capacity out there in the community that, um, that our program managers can utilize? And then lastly, um, does your organization, and this is a really key component of your needs analysis, can you actually deliver that programming in a meaningful way that's going to support your potentially new volunteers? Um, this is our snorkeling program. We teach kids how to snorkel in the river. It's a, there's a lot of safety, there's a lot of safety instrument, instrumented here. Um, but one of the things I realized is I was having a lot of trouble recruiting a lead to run this programming because in the middle of the summer, all of our staff are just running around really, really busy. I recruited uh, one of our education volunteer leads to help me deploy this program one year, a few years ago. And when she was leaving at the end of the summer, she was like, Jason, your interns, your undergraduate interns can handle this. They're, they did 99% of the work. They, they can run it. Um, in the last couple of years, they have. I go out and I train with them and I'm out there for a couple of times. I ask them a lot of questions. I onboard them really seriously, tell them about a lot of safety issues. And then, you know, the, the interns are like four or five years older than the students that they're working with, but they do a great job. Um, and I check in, I check in with the interns every single day, multiple times. So um, making sure, um, you know, making sure you have all those checks and balances is important, but identifying where volunteers can play a leadership role in new programming is a great way to integrate um, volunteer programming with established programming. Yeah, I think I'm going to pass it back to you, Baird. If I can get that to forward. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so if you haven't had time to work your way through the worksheet, now is a good time to do it. And then you can pause and come back. My suggestion would be that if you are, um, that you can work through the worksheet now just to give yourself an idea about what's in it, but take a clean copy of it to a meeting with your program managers as you're brainstorming about what programs you could possibly, um, what programs could use volunteers and, and how, you could, uh, how you could build volunteerism into the core mission of your organization. So, <clears throat> so all this data that we've shared is nice, but who has time to track it if you think about all the steps that are involved in this? And um, my sense, it's, ooh, there we go. My sense uh, is that you really need to automate your organizing in order for this to happen. Um, Actually, we started Watergrass because years ago I taught courses in organizing and the organizers would track their success and that turned out to be absolutely great for their reports to their funders and for the planning of the new, um, of, of the new program the next year. But they only did it when I was asking them to track it. Once they were through our program, they stopped doing it because it took too much time. So we created the database in order to make it easier for people to track this kind of data. And we thought about sort of the steps in organizing for the organizer, um, creating a campaign, inviting the volunteers to sign up and posting that sign up, um, signing in volunteers at the event, collecting waivers, running the event, 
after the event, entering all the data from the participant list. That turned out to be the biggest um, roadblock that many, many organizations had organizers who were running a ton of programs, but they'd never had time to actually enter the data back into the database, so they really couldn't track it. They couldn't track individuals. What they could say is 30 people came to this event, and we estimate they each gave two hours, so that's 60 hours. But they couldn't tell you who the repeat volunteers were, and, and even though they had some in their head. And since there's so much turnover in volunteer leaders, when they left and the next person came in, and it was pretty much a blank slate, and they'd have to start all over again. And then finally, sending that thank you. And along with that thank you is what Jason mentioned, the invitation to take the next step, to come to the next event, to do the repeat volunteerism. So if you would, please go to worksheet number two and think in your program, where's the bottleneck? Is it, and what, is there one of these steps that's just chronically behind or whenever you think about, oh, let's do a volunteer event, you think, oh no, <laughs> let's not, let's not. We never have enough people to sign in volunteers or it's just, we never get the data into the database or it's too much of a hassle to have people sign up. So if you want, you can pause this. My suggestion would be to sit down at some organizational meeting and just ask yourselves, where is the bot? Where is our bottleneck? And then I'd like to show you some tools that you could use to make it easier for that. And there are various. Uh, I'm going to show you tools in Watergrass. There's some other. There are some other tools that you can use to sign people up. But let's go over to Watergrass. Here uh, we're looking at the database. And imagine that we have a river cleanup and it's got all these sub pieces to it. It's got sponsors, it might have donations, and it's got these various different cleanups. And in it, we could set up a cleanup like this downstream cleanup, which is at a particular place. We could say, we could give it a description and then a long description about wearing shoes that can get wet or waterproof boots. Um, we can tell people what the location is, what the hours are. And then down here, we can just say, okay, what is the URL that we can use people to sign up at? And if we click on that, you'll see, oh, look, here's our list. And so there's the downstream cleanup. And if people click on that, this is the URL. I can put that in all my emails. I can see, please come and for this event. And then when people sign up, if I go back in and sign up and we run the event, uh, one thing that we could do, and I'll show you that in a second, is we could sign them in at the event. So that now we're going to be done with that part of it at the event. And then if we go back here to the event itself, we could, and we, after the whole event is over and we've got that list is soggy and crumpled, we come back to the office and we could pretty quickly go through this list. Here's everybody who signed up. I can add people who showed up and weren't in the list. And I could, all right, all these, almost all these people signed up. They almost all gave three hours, so I could say, there's three hours, now everybody's got three hours. This guy here, this very strong guy, he was a no should. And then I could review my list and I could submit that data sheet into the database. And when that gets submitted into the database, I'm not gonna do it now, but if I go to my campaign, you can see the result. Then here, oh, in downstream here's the campaign itself the cleanup you can see it's created it will create donations a donation of two hours for each person who showed up up and who i am with that i'm done with this part and then i could compose for everybody in the campaign an email 
saying thanks so much for coming and for donating your time and here's the next opportunity and we've pushed this one step further now going back to the powerpoint so we've got a remote app where you can actually take it to the event and you can sign people in at the event and you can even under more info there you can record oh why is it that they came out today what are they particularly interested in is there someone in the do they have some piece of information or some capability that they're interested in fundraising perhaps and i should get them in touch with somebody in the office you can record all that in the app and you can even have the app you can send the thank you message to them from the app and the advantage to this is that while you are having that face-to-face -face experience with people and they are saying, wow, this is a cool organization, I like them, I'd like to do more with them, immediately when they get home, they've got a thank you email that gives them the opportunity to connect with you again. In fact, you can even, you can even do what, what Jason suggested. He suggested that you uh, ask people to rat out the other people in the group who might be good leaders. This app actually has a, a checkbox for good leaders. And if you check that box, then when they get their thank you email, they will also get an invitation to a training event or some event afterwards where you would then cultivate them and ask them to become leaders. So we're hoping that the tools like this give volunteer leaders the opportunity to, um, to run their events more smoothly and with less effort so that they spend less time on the nuts and bolts and more time actually talking to people, getting to know them, identifying leaders, and planning for that next cultivation event so that they, they um, recruit more volunteer leaders who we, uh, I believe, as Jason does, that those are actually the bottleneck that we've got in our volunteer programs. So uh, Jason and I would love to talk with you about your program. If you'd like to get together, oh, let me go back. Um, so after all the River Rally, uh, the virtual River Rally presentations are done, the week after that, we will hold a, um, oh gosh, keeps moving. We'll hold a, um, another Zoom conference. And here's the sign up. And the sign up link is also in your, um, it's also in your worksheet, so you can go there, copy, click on that sign up link and sign up for the conversation. We'd, be, we'd love to hear about your programs, the challenges that you have, um, and, uh, and suggestions that you have for us and whatever might make this presentation better. So that's the two of us. There are our emails. And Hannah, back to you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, Baird and Jason, for such a wonderfully thorough presentation. I know I personally learned a lot. Thank you to all of our attendees for turning, tuning in and watching this presentation today. I've just got a couple quick announcements before we sign off. Um, the first one being that if you want to learn more about Baird and Jason or connect with them, um, their names are posted right above this video. If you click on their names, that's a link to their full bio and also their contact information. So please feel free to reference those links above if you'd like to contact with them offline. Um, my second announcement is that if you're wanting to stay connected with other rally participants or you're posting about rally online to please use our hashtag, which is hashtag virtual river rally. Um, it's um, right on this slide as well. So please use that throughout the conference to stay connected and let us know that you're, you're tuning in. Um, our third announcement is that River Network is a membership-based organization. So if you want to learn more about becoming a premium member, the benefits that it has to you and your organization, uh, please feel free to visit us at our website, which is rivernetwork.org, to learn about all of the great perks we have for our premium members, um, which is nationwide. And then my last announcement, um, and maybe the most exciting, is to save the date for River Rally 2021. We are planning to be in San Antonio, Texas with all of you next May, May 14th through the 17th. So fingers crossed that we will all be together in San Antonio next year for Rally. Um, so thanks again for tuning in. Thanks again to Baird and Jason. Do you two have any final closing thoughts for our audience today? I just wanted to re-emphasize the value of being a member of River Network. River Network has been the motor behind building the 
watershed movement in the United States, the river and watershed mo movement. And if you compare numbers of like watershed groups to numbers of other organizations, of organizations in other sectors of the environmental community, over the past 20 years, watershed groups have the numbers and the size has, has grown much faster than other similar environmental organizations. And a lot of that has to do with the work that River Network's done. So I hope you'll be a member of it. It's a great investment. Thanks for the shout out. <laughs> All right, well, we're gonna sign off. Thanks for tuning in. Keep an eye out for other rally live sessions and on-demand content, and we will see you soon.